Our topic this evening is the Book of Enoch, and maybe you think, well, haven't you already had lectures on the Book of Enoch? Well, one, there's more than one Book of Enoch, and the most recent lecture we've had is on uh, a book that's called Second Enoch. This time we're going back to First Enoch again. We have had a previous lecture on this topic, but we were primarily looking at essentially where did that book come from, what's its context. We we're looking at um, its canonicity in the Ethiopian and Eritrean church and so forth. This time we're going to do kind of a deep dive into that first book of Enoch. So if we go to the New Testament, to the epistle of Jude, which is the second to last book right before Revelation. In the New Testament, it's also among the very shortest books in the whole Bible. It's only one chapter long. Uh, by its salutation, the epistle to Jude claims as its author, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And so by tradition and certainly probably by the intent of the author, the particular, there's more than one James, as we've seen, but the particular James, or Jacob in this case, is thought to be the leader of the Jerusalem church, the Jamesian church that we've talked about. James the just, James the brother of Jesus. And so in claiming to be uh, Jude the brother of James, which James is the brother of Jesus by the transitive principle, the idea here is that this is um, supposedly written anywhere, claims to be written by Jude, the brother of Jesus. And indeed, uh, in the Gospels, in Mark and in Matthew, um, both of those have stories about Jesus' brothers and list Jude or Judah as the name of one of Jesus' brothers. And by tradition, these are usually understood to be Jesus' half-brothers, so uh, these are brothers uh, who are children of Joseph, but not children of Mary. Or, that's how the tradition normally works, the more recent tradition works. Um, James, the brother of Jesus. And we may ask, why? Why does uh, Jude, if he's actually the brother of Jesus, why would he call himself the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James? Why wouldn't you kind of start with, hey, I'm Jesus' brother <laughs> in Christianity? And part of this is um, probably that there is a different uh, degree of authority that is afforded to James within the Jamesian church. So James is actually the leader of the church much longer than the time period that Jesus was alive. And we have traditions that, um, for example, a saying that exists in the, the Gospel of Thomas um, that says that, uh, both says that James should be the, the leader of the movement after uh, Jesus is no longer with uh, the Christians, the proto-Christians. Um, and also that heaven and earth came into being for James. So in other words, that James is very important uh, figure within the Jamesian church, sort of on the par with John the Baptist and, uh, and maybe having Jesus then being less important proportionately than to the rest of Christianity. So the epistle um, of Jude is itself literarily dependent, on, or I'm sorry, it's dependent on, it uses ideas from the epistle of James. Um, and then the Epistle of 2 Peter, another New Testament text, is literarily dependent on Jude. So those, all three of those texts, in other words, are related to each other. And they all kind of represent kind of the thinking and position of this Jamesian church. And we're definitely going to talk about the Jamesian or Jacobite, Jacobin church when we are talking about the, um, you know, that lecture that we're going to do soon about why Paul's church is one. So, like the Epistle of James, like the Epistle of 2 Peter, um, Jude is pseudonymous. So, even though we're when saying the author here is Jude, the author is actually somebody other than the authority it names. So, um, I think almost all scholars say it's amazingly unlikely that um, 
the, a brother of Jesus, an actual brother of Jesus, will have written um, this kind of later first century letter, uh, which is in you know pretty passable, uh, well-spoken Greek, um, especially considering again we're dealing with poor, lower middle class, lower class um, Galilean, not peasants, but peasant carpenter types family, you know, uh, and so. Um, anyway, and it's also not, not, not likely. It's a very common practice throughout the Bible, and you know, all of the um, texts of the Bible that are meant to be from associates and family members of Jesus are understood to be pseudonymous. And so most scholars date this to the end of the first century or the beginning of the second century and coming out of the Jamesian church. Uh, in terms of its content, Jude is primarily a warning against certain intruders. It says, quote, certain intruders who have stolen in among you. So there are these intruders in the Christian community who pervert the grace of our God into debauchery. So one of the characteristics of the Jamesian church is uh, that the members continue to observe Mosaic law, they continue to keep kosher, and so law is, is very important in, in, in their understanding, whereas there are other Christian communities that reject law and who say that you shouldn't actually keep uh, that law because instead uh, they are focusing on grace. And so this idea of perverting grace <laughs> and turning it into debauchery may be a veiled reference to Paul and the Pauline Christian communities. Uh, Paul in the letter to Romans, for example, taught, you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. But for Jude, the freedom of God's grace without law uh, is perverted into debauchery as far as they're concerned. So whether Paul is among the false teachers that Jude has in mind, um, Jude sees whoever these false teachers they are condemning as having been predicted by the prophets of old. So in the epistle of Jude, we read, it was about these false teachers that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied saying, Quote, see the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all the deeds of ungodliness that they've committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So the coming of these ungodly ones, these um, false teachers, these Christians who, um, who think that grace is what's important and not, not the law, uh, this is predicted by uh, the prophet Enoch, according to Jude. And of course, it's very common uh, in the New Testament for authors to quote the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Old Testament. And so if we get out our Bibles and we turn to Genesis, in the whole long list of begats, so the generations, the genealogies that exist in the book of Genesis, we find the name Enoch, and it is six generations from Adam. So in other words, Enoch is Adam's great, 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 great grandson. However, we do not find this quotation that is attributed to him by Jude. Uh, indeed, there's no prophecy or statement by Enoch at all in the text. He's more or less just mentioned uh, and very briefly in, in Genesis chapter 5, 18 through 24. So we read in Genesis, uh, when Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. Jared lived after the birth of Enoch, 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. 
Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him. And so that's it. We don't have uh, that quotation or any prophecy or anything more, just that little bit. Uh, like I say, out of this genealogy list, this list of begats. Uh, Jared begat Enoch, who begat Methuselah, who begat Lamech, who begat Noah. So the genealogical list that we find in Genesis 5 and then later again in Genesis 11 are a, probably a pre-existing text, a text that's older than the rest of the Torah, which is used by the editor or redactor of the Torah to connect different stories of the Genesis narrative into like one complete story. They would have been separate texts or separate myths that are now uh, brought together to give it a kind of quasi-historical feel. Though separated, the genealogies fit together and uh, many scholars think anyway they were part of an independent source pre-biblical source, which is labeled the Book of Generations. And if we look at the Book of Generations, these are uh, the times, periods of the uh, patriarchs who live both before, during, and after the Great Flood, Noah's Flood. Before the Flood, they all live very, very long amounts of years. You can kind of see here in the the red is the amount of time before they have their son, and then gray is the amount of time until they die. The dotted line here that you see is when the flood happens. And then after the flood, uh, sort of the, the lifespans contract kind of rapidly until we get down to Abraham, who lives 175 years, uh, according to this book of generations. And so, um, in terms of all of this, then, if we see Enoch, you can kind of see Enoch as the one before the flood right here that we zoom in on that has a uniquely stubby bar because he, uh, after his, the birth of his son Methuselah, he lives another 300 years and then he walks with God because God, God took him. And so it's a very unusual, almost the only thing that we hear about any of um, the antediluvian uh, patriarchs between Seth and uh, Noah, anyway. So that's all we know from Genesis. He lived a much shorter time than the rest of the antediluvian patriarchs. He walked with God. God took him. God took him is plausibly a euphemism for dying by misadventure rather than old age, but readers very early on were intrigued by that phrase, and they have always preferred to offer interpretations that are much more exciting. And so certainly by the Second Temple period, um, this is understood, may have originally been intended this way, but it's understood by then that God took him up into heaven with him. And so, for example, in the Septuagint translation, when the Egyptian uh, Jewish translators translated the original Hebrew into Greek, they rendered God took him using the Greek verb metatithemi, which means uh, it has a sense of moving from one place to another, so it's not just, um, it's more like transporting. Use the transporter on him. Um, this same sense is found in the third century book of Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, which says, Enoch pleased the Lord and was taken up as an example of repentance to all generations. So he ascends to heaven, as in this uh, medieval manuscript diagram of him ascending to heaven on a ladder. So, um, even though the way the Bible works, and as we'll look at the, um, the canonization process, that there is an Old Testament, then there is a big gap, and then there's the New Testament, uh, that doesn't mean that there was no revelation in that intertestamentary period of time, uh, the Second Temple period, but the way the books were being written is different. So the kind of prophecy that uh, Jewish writers were having is a different style, and they also didn't make it into uh, the canon with a few exceptions, the most important exception being the, the book of Daniel. Um, the most common style for uh, prophetic texts uh, between the Old Testament and the New Testament 
evolved away from the kind of direct poetic visions, for example, in the original parts of Isaiah, and also, for example, in the book of Jeremiah, where um, prophets are uh, speaking or saying, uh, proclaiming to speak uh, the word of God directly, thus saith the Lord. Um, and they do it, generally speaking, in a poetic style of a poetic vision. So this moves to, we call instead, kind of apocalyptic visions that are shared through angels. And so in apocalypses, um, a prophet will have an angel come to them and show them a vision. Uh, and that vision, apoc the word apocalypse just means revelation, but it also comes to have the meaning that we have for it, which is, you know, the world is going to end and here's what will happen after the end of the world. And so the authors of these apocalypses in this intertestamentary period, this time after the Old Testament, before the New Testament, frequently assume the authority of a big biblical figure by, for example, pretending to be a famous person from the Bible and as if that person is writing it. And so the book of Daniel is famously uh, written that way, written hundreds of years after when um, Daniel would have lived. There's also, though, um, pseudepigraphic books of Moses, of Ezra, of Abraham, of Solomon, and of course of Enoch. Because of this reference in, um, in this understanding in Genesis that God took Enoch to heaven, he became a very natural choice for later pseudepigraphists. And that's why we have more than one uh, book attributed to Enoch, one, and three of them. Um, as we mentioned, the word apocalypse comes from a Greek word meaning unveiling or revelation. And so when we sometimes call uh, the book of Revelations is sometimes called the apocalypse. It's the same, same word. It's just the Greek and the Latin uh, versions of that. Apocalypses come in response to unfulfilled prophecy and failures of the Deuteronomic answer to the problem of evil. So the earlier kind of answer to the problem of evil, uh, why do the righteous, why do the Israelites suffer? It's because they turn away from God and begin worshiping pagan gods and so on. They need to return to uh, the worship of the God of Israel, of Yahweh and Yahweh alone. Um, however, by the time the Second Temple period rolls around, uh, the Jewish people do that. They do become, you know, monolatrists and then eventually monotheists. They do not worship other gods, they, uh, and yet they continue to be punished. So uh, the Persians continue to be uh, dominating them. Later, when the Macedonians and Greeks uh, under Alexander take over, um, they consider themselves to be even more oppressed. Why would this keep happening? Um, also, there are groups of uh, Second Temple Jewish people who disagree with the uh, temple elite. So the Sadducee class that controls the temple um, is frequently uh, collaborating with. They're appointed as Persian officials or later as uh, by the different Greek Hellenistic kings, and they are Persianizing and Hellenizing. And so uh, the way they are running things, the way they are running the temple, is seen by some of the sects of uh, Second Temple Judaism, the Essenes, uh, the Pharisees in some cases, as being um, improperly done. And so as a result, the world seems out of whack. The Jewish people are continuing to suffer. They are not able to be uh, independent and have their own righteous kingdom. And indeed, even their local leaders, as far as some sects are concerned, uh, are doing everything wrong. And so drawing on Persian and Zoroastrian ideas, so Persia is this great empire of which, in the Second Temple period, the beginning anyway, Jerusalem is simply a backwater 
provincial capital of a Persian province. Um, the Persian and Zoroastrian religion has um, really interesting ideas about, for example, cosmic dualism. Suffering occurs in the world because the um, great god of light is being countered by a, um, a god of darkness. And there is a ongoing struggle between good and evil, but eventually that will um, end in an apocalypse when this world will be destroyed and a future world will emerge, which will involve a restoration of a paradise, a resurrection of the righteous, uh, saviors and are associated with this process at different places and uh, the wicked finally everybody who's getting this wrong all of Israel's tormentors and also all of the traitors they will all and the wicked they will all be uh, eternally punished and so all of these ideas which had not really been in um, the earlier parts of the Hebrew Bible pre-exilic uh, Old Testament Instead, now they all enter into the mainstream uh, after exposure to Persian and Zoroastrian ideas. Okay, so let's look at these books of Enoch and specifically the one we'll be looking at tonight, First Enoch. So these are not, uh, not related texts. So some books like First and Second Kings, those are really just two parts of the same book that's written at the same time. Uh, in this case, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Enoch are not related books. So they are written at different times by totally different uh, authors or redactors. So the earliest and most important one is the one we're talking about tonight, 1st Enoch is what it's usually called. Um, it's also often called the Ethiopic Book of Enoch because uh, while it was originally written in either Aramaic or in a combination of Aramaic and Hebrew, possibly just originally in Hebrew, but way less likely. Parts of it will have certainly been in Aramaic. The full text survives only in Gaeas, which is one of the Ethiopian languages, so Ethiopic. Um, some of it is very early, so some parts are from the 300s or 200s before the Common Era. Second Enoch is called Slavonic Enoch, and we've done a whole lecture on this one as well. So that survives in entirety only in Old Church Slavonic because it was uh, important in Eastern Europe. The Bogomils uh, uh, Christians, well, not Christians, but the Bogomil uh, religion uh, looked at it and you had it as important. Um, it's probably um, from a lost. I mean, it was from a Greek translation, possibly originally Hebrew, um, probably written in the first century of the Common Era, the Christian Era. And finally, we have Third Enoch, much less important book, which survives in Hebrew, uh, but contains Latin and Greek loan words, and so it's because it's from the second century of the Common Era or later. In this case, Third Enoch probably knows the other two books and is just writing more themselves. So like I say, this is going to be the focus, first Enoch. So the previous lecture, the context of Enoch, there's almost 500,000 views. Um, but because we didn't have a lot of time to really focus on the text, I thought, well, there's a lot of interest in this book. Let's go back uh, and look at the context rather than spending so much time on the Ethiopian and Eritrean Tewahedo churches. So if you want to um, see that and you haven't watched that lecture, I advise you to go look at the context uh, in the previous lecture. So First Enoch is a very influential apocalypse as we've already seen when I quoted it. It's quoted, it's um, the book of Jude, which is part of the New Testament canon, quoted it directly and so there's several um, early Christian writers who seem to have considered First Enoch to be scripture. And lots of the um, early Christian writers also, the earliest Christian fathers who are not scriptural, but in the next, you know, second and third centuries also um, 
looked at First Enoch and thought of it as being sort of part of the canon. So in addition to the quotations in Jude, there are indications that the language that we read in First Enoch and actually some of its ideas, its thought, influenced several other really important New Testament texts, New Testament texts including the Gospels of Matthew, of Luke with the book of Acts, which is the second part of Luke, the Gospel of John, a bunch of Paul's letters have these indications, so Romans, Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Colossians, 1st Timothy, so that's both authentic letters of Paul and also um, people who are writing later in Paul's name, and on top of that, uh, the epistles of 1st John, Hebrews, and, Revel and the book of Revelation, so actually a vast um, popularity throughout the early Christian communities since this is a span of uh, many different uh, early Christian communities that are, in a lot of cases, in conflict with each other. And they all are looking back to First Enoch. It's also influential within the rest of the um, family of Pseudepigrapha. So uh, books like The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, The Testament of Abraham, The Apocalypse of Abraham, The Assumption of Moses, the fourth book of Ezra, the second book of Baruch, all of these kind of second temple period, apocalyptic pseudepigraphic literature also are aware of First Enoch and are using ideas that are there. And on top of all this, there are uh, lots of fragments of First Enoch that are found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is also, um, in addition to being important to early Christians. It was also important as, whether it's scripture or an important text anyway, to other uh, Jewish sects of the Second Temple period, specifically the Essenes at Qumran, who uh, were the people who kept the Dead Sea Scrolls. So how do we get the text? I've mentioned that First Enoch in its full version survives only in Gaia is only an Ethiopic. There's actually two major um, versions that have come through in Ethiopic. So one, the Alpha version, is thought to be more closer to the Aramaic original. There's also a Beta uh, set of manuscripts that have additional edits and additional additions. Um, and so, anyway, there's different components that we have, but on, the first, the whole text is only existing in that Ethiopic translation. There may have been a Hebrew original, if so, it's lost. Um, actually, as we're going to see, this text has many, many component parts, and so maybe some fragment of it or some component of it is written in Hebrew, but a lot of them probably were, a lot of components of it were probably composed in Aramaic. Uh, we know from another um, Second Temple period Apocalypse, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is partially composed in Hebrew and partially in Aramaic, so these languages are both in use, the one as a liturgical language, the one as the everyday language. So Hebrew, uh, the older language, and the Aramaic has come to displace that as the lingua franca of the Levant in the Second Temple period. So uh, be that as it may, if there was a Hebrew original or not, there are some 11 Aramaic fragments of First Enoch that have been recovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And some of these include whole big sections of Enoch that don't exist in the Ethiopic version. So um, there's more than one, there's more than one book of this. <laughs> you know, there's a bunch of different material and that's, some of it is, uh, is housed in different traditions. There was a Greek translation uh, of which uh, only a small fragments survive. Um, some of the, you know, sometimes the Ethiopic books are translated directly from Aramaic, and sometimes they go through this Greek translation. So uh, I, I, th I think it's not entirely clear how much of um, the Ethiopic version, the full complete version, uh, may have made it through the, a Greek intermediary to get to us. Um, certainly the 
the Latin fragments that we have are translations probably from the Greek, and it does seem like maybe the Coptic fragment that we have. We also have a, a Syriac fragment, um, which is probably because of how close Syriac to Aramaic, it's probably going back to the Aramaic. Um, in, in any event, uh, you can see just based on how many of these uh, languages we have fragments of this text surviving, and it was a popular text even though uh, it didn't survive in all of the other languages, only in Ethiopic. Uh, part of the reason for that is that while it's um, really popular with the earliest Christian fathers, including people like Tertullian, by the time we get to Augustine and Jerome, um, they don't like it, and they don't think it's, they think it's not uh, going back to the real Enoch, and they are not seeing it as scripture, and so Augustine is ultimately um, the guy who makes a council where he lists what, the, what, what books are going to be in the canon. Um, he, it's just a local provincial synod, but because that ends up being the the final list, he, he is one of the people who's influential, and so it doesn't make it into um, the bulk of the Christian canon of the Bible. Like I say, it's in the Ethiopian and Eritrean uh, church's Bible. So that's how the text survives and has come down to us. In its present form, it's a relatively long text. Um, it's sub subdivided into five major books. But as we'll see, these books even are composed, composite books uh, include fragments of earlier texts. So it is really in and of itself its own little Bible, its own little library. So of these books, they are the Book of the Watchers, which is an expansion of the Genesis story before the flood, the antediluvian parts of Genesis. Um, Next is the book of similitudes, which are long apocalyptic parables. Then we have an astronomical book that discusses the Enochic calendar, the calendar of Enoch here. Uh, then we have a book of dreams and visions that um, has two different visions, the second of which is sometimes called the animal apocalypse, um, which is making the Bible into uh, a story with a bunch of animals, which will be fun, it's fun maybe to make a kid's movie out of. <laughs> but anyway, which also takes um, uh, the history down to, I mean, from the Bible times all the way down to the time period of the Maccabees, obviously the contemporary era when the Book of Dream Visions was written. And then from there, it predicts a future, a future that didn't happen but a coming, an imminently coming apocalypse and what the world will be like at the end of the world and after the Day of Judgment. And we end with an epistle to Enoch, which is itself a composite of a bunch of interesting little texts. And so of all of these um, major sections, um, these are probably a composite of earlier texts which were not, um, which were separate. So there was probably a book of the Watchers, a book of Parables of Enoch, an astronomical book, a book of dream visions, and an epistle of Enoch, which is itself, like I say, made up of other component texts. All of these were edited together by a, a redactor who um, left kind of a final after note at the chapter 108, the end, the end note of this. And so scholars um, date the Book of the Watchers to the fourth or third centuries, and the astronomical book maybe to the third century. And so those are kind of the earliest parts and maybe I'm gonna say the most important parts. And so those are the parts I'm gonna spend most time on tonight. Then there is this, um, parables of Enoch. So that's parts could be from the first century BCE, but there may be parts that are written, some, some scholars say, as, as late as the third century of the common era, third century AD. Um, it's not clear because maybe what's happened instead is there has been 
Christian interpolation where some Christian stuff has been added and that's, that's taking a, an earlier Jewish text and kind of Christianizing it and so that's making it seem later than it is. So that's why it's kind of a big range there, question mark, depending on how, that, um, how those were put together. Um, then like I say, we have this book of dream visions that comes right down to a, um, with that animal apocalypse, that comes right down to a particular moment in history. It gets history, first it's just the Bible, but then it gets history right all the way down to the Maccabean revolt. And around the time period of 163 to 142, that's when it ends. So that's when we know it was written. <laughs> because then after that, it starts predicting a future. The world is gonna end really soon and all that kind of thing, that apocalyptic part, uh, which did not happen. And so that's why we can date that. And then, like I say, um, there's this epistle of Enoch, which uh, is written maybe in the second or first centuries BCE. So we'll look at these in turn, especially the Book of Watchers and the Astronomical Book. So the Book of Watchers, earliest component of First Enoch, um, definitely has, and like I say, sections that maybe date to the third and fourth century. The text expands on the brief story in Genesis, chapter 6, where the sons of God take human wives, giving birth to the heroes of old. And it also is kind of an expansion of the account of the beginnings of civilization that's found in Genesis chapter 4. So why don't we look at those, because they're really short, and see what uh, the source material the author is working from in the Bible in order to expand out a much, much, much larger account. So in Genesis 6, immediately prior to the flood story, uh, we read, when people began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, the sons of El, saw that they were fair and they took wives for themselves of all they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. So um, as we talked about uh, recently in our Baal and Asherah lectures, the sons, and actually our angelology lecture, the sons of El are traces of old gods in a pre-monotheist Israelite pantheon. Over time, these gradually reduced to angels, and they're definitely understood as angels by the time we get to the Second Temple period, and the readers, the authors of the various parts of the Book of Enoch understand that that way. Um, that section in Genesis continues. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went in to the daughters of humans who bore children to them, these were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. So from this really brief passage, we understand that the offspring of marriages between human women and these gods or angels, uh, the sons of El, become the heroes of old mighty warriors like the demigods Gilgamesh and Heracles from uh, Sumerian and Greek mythology, along with the Nephilim, which is a Hebrew word for ones who have fallen. And this is usually translated as giants, but they're also sort of semi-divine giants uh, who are maybe kind of similar mythologically to the Titans in Greek mythology and the Jotnar in Norse mythology, this idea of an earlier, more primordial group of gods that the more recent gods uh, fight with, so Nephilim. So another brief passage in Genesis also influences this first component of the Book of Enoch, the Book of Watchers, the Book of the Watchers. Then Cain, so Cain is the uh, first son of Adam and Eve who kills his brother Abel. And so after he's killed Abel, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he, Cain, built a city and named it Enoch after his son Enoch. So 
in Genesis, as we have it, you know, this is not too many people on the earth yet <laughs> that we have names of anyway in Genesis. And Cain's son named Enoch, you know, so this is Adam's grandson. This though is a very different person, at least in the Genesis as we have it written from Adam's great, 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 great grandson, Enoch, who is the son of Jared, the person who is the um, Enoch that we're talking about in this book. But it's interestingly here that we have uh, also in Genesis another Enoch and um, a point of confusion, you know, as people um, later are writing their own traditions about Enoch in the, um, uh, in the restoration tradition in Mormonism in scripture written by Joseph Smith, um, this, there, he creates a whole long story or tells a whole long story about Enoch and the Enoch that he's talking about is the Enoch who walks with God, but that Enoch builds a city, the city of Enoch, uh, which is taken up to heaven. And so um, I think it's probably not a coincidence that there is this other Enoch here and there's a city named Enoch <laughs> in Genesis in terms of um, uh, inspiring Joseph Smith's idea about uh, a city of Enoch. So that, uh, story in Genesis 4 continues. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod was the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael the father of Lamech. Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the ancestor of those who live in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the ancestor of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah bore Tubal-Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. So, um, we have actually competing genealogies in Genesis. Uh, the main one, the kind of line of patriarchs as it later, or as it's most understood, the righteous patriarchs, uh, Adam and Eve have a replacement son after Abel is killed and Cain is exiled, who has Enosh, then Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, and then Noah has three sons uh, uh, who survive after the flood, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Um, but in the that comes from the book of records. Uh, like I said, this is this idea of a a pre-biblical um, source that the biblical redactor is adding in to create the book of Genesis. Um, but the Yahwist source, the J source, who's one of the main authors, authors of the Torah, uh, Genesis has this other genealogy where Adam and Eve bear Cain and Abel, and Abel is killed, then Cain's Kid is Enoch, who bare Erad, who built Mahuel, to Metsushael, then Lamech, and Lamech's descendants. But you can kind of see on here, there's some repeats. So Lamech is at the same at the, bot, at the end of this, as is Enoch higher up, and then Mahalalel and you know, Methuselah have ones that are sort of similar, but are not quite the same. And, but it's possibly what's going on here is there are pre-biblical traditions that both of these sources are drawing from and aware of, and they're telling the story differently. So in some cases, maybe Enoch and Lamech here are not actually different Enoch and Lamech the way they end up being in the final Bible, but are rather a different tradition about Enoch and Lamech. So. So, be that as it may, chapter 6, uh, First Enoch, um, in other words, from the book of the Wash, Watchers, is an expansion of the Genesis chapter 6 story. And here, um, the sons of El, the sons of God, are now explicitly called angels. So, in the book of the Watchers, we read, it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters, and the angels, the children of heaven, 
saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Samjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath and bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then they all swore together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it, and they were in all 200 Two hundred of these fallen angels who descended in the days of Jared, so uh, the father of Enoch, who descended on the summit of Mount Hermon. And these are the names of their leaders: Samlazaz, their leader; Arakleba, Remiel; Koklebel, Temlel, Remlel, Danel, Ezekiel, Barakwajal, Asael. Armaros, Bedarel, Anael, Zaquiel, Samsapiel, I don't need to, are you liking all these L names? Saturel, Turel, Jamjael, Sariel. These are their chiefs of ten. And all the others got together with them and took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and they began to go into them and to defile themselves with them, and they taught them charms and enchantments. So they're now teaching the wives here magic and also the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants, so herbology. And the women became pregnant and they bare great giants whose height was 300 cubits, so maybe 450 feet tall, these giant giants, the length of Noah's Ark who consumed all the acquisitions of men. So these giants are so huge that they're consuming everything that the humans can possibly grow. And the, when, when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. So they're so much bigger than people, and so now they're just having the people for snacks. So these excerpts sort of show how the Book of the Watcher's author you know, has kind of greatly expanded the tiny kernels that he found in Genesis. Um, so the little reference that we had to the sons of El, that's elaborated to a host of 200 angels led by Samjaza, plus all of these other wonderful El names that we have for uh, fallen angels. So the angels are initially sent to watch over mankind, hence the Watchers, that's the book of the Watchers. Instead, um, they swear this pact among themselves to take human wives, resulting in these giants of incredible size. However, um, as we already saw uh, with the, they were also teaching things like uh, enchantments and, and other, uh, other sorts of uh, knowledge they were teaching to the uh, giants and, the, and their wives. They also taught men, and so uh, Azazel, Azazel, one of these fallen angels, taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made it known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all coloring tinctures. Samjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings Armaros, the resolving of enchantments. Barakajal taught astrology. Kokabel taught the constellations. Azikael taught the knowledge of clouds. Arakuel taught the signs of the earth. Shamsiel, the signs of the sun. Sariel, the course of the moon. So essentially all of this um, early natural philosophy, ancient science, um, how meteorology works, how astrology works, enchantments and, and reversing enchantments and so on is all taught by the watchers, the fallen angels. The origin here then, they're the origin of civilization, which obviously then has a negative tint. So if, the, if it's the evil angels that are ca causing all of this or teaching all of this, then there's sort of an attitude here that civilization is itself uh, corrupt. So this results in chaos on earth. Uh, the giant children, as we saw, were eating human flesh, 
and the fallen angels have taught everybody how to make weapons of war and also to wear makeup and it's causing a lot of chaos. <laughs> so all of this attention gets the attention of um, uh, heaven's archangels. And so we read then Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel looked down from earth and saw much blood being shed upon the earth and all lawlessness being wrought upon the earth. And they said to one another, the earth from her empty foundation has brought the cry of their voice up to the gates of heaven. And now, O holy ones of heaven, the souls of the people make their suit pleading, bring our case before the Most High. So having um, been alerted to the whole situation by the archangels and surveying the damage, God chooses to correct the problem. The only, it, this essentially giving um, what doesn't really exist in the uh, in Genesis, an, a moral excuse uh, for why does God destroy all the humans and everything in the flood? It's because of uh, uh, there's a moral necessity, the book of Enoch here argues. So then said the Most High, the Holy and Great One spake, and he sent Uriel to the son of Lamech, and he said to him, Go to Noah, so Noah is the son of Lamech, and tell him in my name, hide thyself, and reveal to him, reveal, tell Noah that the end is approaching, that the whole earth will be destroyed, and a deluge is about to come upon the whole earth, and will destroy all that is in it, and now instruct him that he may escape, and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world. So there's going to be a flood, and Noah's, we're going to get to the Noah story, just like in Genesis. But there's more about the angels in, and actually the whole story is a lot longer in uh, the book of the Watchers here in First Enoch. So the Lord said to Raphael, one of the other archangels, bind Azazel uh, hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert, which is in the Dudael and cast him therein and place upon him rough and jagged rocks and cover him with darkness and let him abide there forever and cover his face that he might not see light. So the fallen angel is to be cast into a pit and covered over with uh, rocks and so forth. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire and heal the earth which the angels have corrupted and proclaim the healing of the earth that they may heal the plague and that all the children of men may not perish through all the secret things that the watchers have disclosed and taught their sons. So we're gonna wipe out this whole contamination process by killing everybody and wiping everything away. And meanwhile, the angels, the fallen angels who are the problem, they're bound and thrown into a pit until the day of judgment. Um, you might realize here that the idea of a day of judgment, again, this is not something that exists in Genesis. This is an idea that has come into the religion in the time period of Second Temple Judaism. So like I say, in keeping with the context of Second Temple period concerns, the Book of Watchers here is expanding the biblical text. So it's developing the angelology. So now we get all these named angels and the demonology, all these named demons and what they're in charge of. It connects the flood narrative also with the idea of a future apocalypse. So we had the other one, but there will now be a day of judgment we're hearing about in the future, and that punishment after the day of judgment is going to be by hellfire. So none of those things are pre-exilic themes. Those don't exist in Genesis, for example. After narrating the expanded story of the Watchers, so we're now reintroduced in the book of the Watchers in chapter 12 to Enoch. And so we read, before these things, Enoch was hidden and no one of the children of men knew where he was hidden and where he abode and what had become of him. And his activities had to do with the Watchers, these fallen angels, and his days were with the holy ones. The text now switches to the first person as though it were written by Enoch himself. And so this may be a seam in the text, a new component of it. I, Enoch, was blessing the Lord of majesty and the king of ages, and lo, the watchers called me, 
Enoch the scribe, and said to me, Enoch, thou scribe of righteousness. And so the watchers give a big long appeal to Enoch to appeal on their behalf, um, which is an interesting thing to have happen. So they, they're being punished and they want to be forgiven. Uh, Enoch presents the appeal, but heaven denies it and explains why uh, they are going to be punished forever. Um, and then after that, Enoch is given a much bigger vision of the understand of the workings of the cosmos so he can understand this whole thing. He's taken up into the heavens, he journeys through the earth, through Shoal, the underworld, and so forth. So uh, we read that uh, in chapter 14, behold, in the vision, clouds invited me and a mist summoned me and the chorus of the stars and the lightning sped and hastened me and the winds in the vision caused me to fly and lifted me upward and bore me into heaven. And I went till I drew nigh to a wall, which is built of crystals and surrounded by tongues of fire. And it began to affright me. And I went into the tongues of fire and drew nigh to a large house, which was built of crystals. And the wall of the house were like a tessellated floor made of crystals and its groundwork was of crystal. And the ceiling was like a path of the stars and the lightnings. And between them were fiery cherubim and their heaven was clear as water. A flaming fire surrounded the walls and its portals blazed with fire. So just essentially having a much more, this is also very typical whenever we're seeing kind of second temple period stuff, this kind of vision of heaven elaborated in, uh, in ways that are anything that you can imagine, all the sort of CGI special effects that you'd have, crystals and lightning and, and f flashing things, fire, um, uh, more glorious than can be described is the basic gist. So um, as with God's description, that God speaks from the whirlwind in the book of Job, Enoch in uh, this book of the Watchers vision is allowed to see kind of the workings of the cosmos, how, how uh, all of the universe fits together, um, which is generally envisioned as God keeping vast storehouses uh, where he is able to store up lightning, for example, for later use when it's needed. And so Enoch says, I saw the places of the luminaries, which is to say the sun, moon, stars, and so forth, and the treasuries of the stars and of the thunder and in the ut uttermost depths where, we, uh, where were a fiery bow and arrows and their quiver and a fiery sword and all the lightnings. So it's got all the places where the stars and the sun and moon and everything are stored along with uh, a kind of the, the bow or the, the elaborate device that is used to shoot lightning. And they took me also to the living waters and to the fire of the west, which receives every setting sun. So he's seeing where when the sun goes down over the horizon, the sun is stored or is received into the uh, the living waters. I saw the treasuries of all the winds, all the storehouses where God keeps wind for later use. I saw God, how God had furnished with them the whole creation and the firm foundations of the earth, and I saw the cornerstone of the earth. And so, again, we're still dealing here probably uh, in the second, middle second temple period, this is an early, relatively early book, with uh, the uh, Old Testament uh, picture of how the world works, which is a, the idea is a flat earth with a uh, hemispheric firmament of the heavens above it, a sky above which are the waters that are above the firmament, below the earth at the depths of Shoal, and below that is the waters of the great deep, and then God exists above and outside of the uh, cosmos in the heaven of heavens, and a window can be opened up in the sky through which the uh, waters of beyond the firmament are able to uh, cause the flood and so forth. And so seeing those things, the 
cornerstone and uh, on which the, earth, the cornerstone on which the earth is built, the shoal below the earth, and so on. The angels take Enoch on a journey over the whole earth. He comes eventually to a place with seven magnificent mountains. We read, quote, in the seventh mountain, in the midst of these, and it excelled them in height, and it resembled the seat of a throne, and fragrant trees encircled the throne, and amongst them was a tree such as I have never yet smelt. Neither was any among them, nor were others like it. It had a fragrance beyond all fragrance, and its leaves and blooms and wood wither not forever, and its fruit is beautiful, and its fruit resembles the dates of a palm. So uh, Enoch here comes to you know, maybe the far east where he has a vision of Enoch, I'm sorry, of Eden, and he sees the tree of life that he is very interested in and curious about. So he asks the archangel Michael, who is guiding him at this point, to explain what he's seeing. And Michael answered, saying, This high mountain which thou hast seen, whose summit is like the throne of God, is his throne. So you, you saw it looked like a throne? Guess what? It is. <laughs> this is where the Holy Great One, the Lord of glory, the eternal King, will sit when he has come down to visit the earth with goodness. And as for this fragrant tree, no mortal is permitted to touch it till the great judgment, when he, God, shall take vengeance on all and bring everything to its consummation forever. It shall then be given to the righteous and holy. Its fruit shall be for the food to the elect. It shall be transplanted to the holy place, to the temple of the Lord, the eternal King." So the tree of life is off here in Eden, or in where, wherever this is, where the, uh, the throne is sitting. All that stuff is going to get moved to where the temple is, to Jerusalem, when the apocalypse comes. And then will all the righteous people be able to uh, you know, consume the, the fruit of the tree of life for eternity as they live in eternal life with God. So this pre this antediluvian, this Edenic imagery is here mixed with these sort of post-apocalyptic predictions of a coming paradise, which is again a very common theme in the Second Temple period that um, you, know, you can see builds into what Christian ideas are. So you can see where all of these ideas, they don't sound too alien. They are sort of alien for the Hebrew Bible. These are development that have taken place um, later, I mean, it's in books like Daniel. Daniel's written later than this book. But uh, the pre-exilic books don't have this. But this kind of, um, these ideas are not alien to New Testament Christianity, as the New Testament writers are very familiar with this book. All right, so we just, looked at, we just did a kind of a deep dive into the book of the Watchers. Um, if we look at these other books, I mentioned the, the other one that's um, old that I want to pay some attention to is the astronomical book, the astronomical writings, um, which are chapters, you should all say down there, chapters, chapters 72 through 82. So in the astronomical book, uh, Enoch is shown how the sun, the moon, the stars, and planets operate exactly as they are. So um, people before you've been observing the sun and the moon and everything like that, Enoch is getting a sure knowledge here of how they work. So we read at the beginning of the text, the book of the courses of the luminaries of heaven. So in other words, the sun and the moon and the planets, the luminaries, uh, the, how they're moving in their courses, the relations of each according to their classes, their dominion and their seasons, according to their names and the places of origin, and according to their months, with which Uriel, the holy angel who was with me, who is their guide, showed me. And he showed me all their laws, all the laws of how the heavens and all astronomy is working, exactly as they are, and how it is with regard to all years of the world and unto eternity, until that time when a new creation abides forever is created. So, in other words, until we get to the apocalypse and we're going to have an end of the world and a, and a, and a new time, this is how uh, the heavens work. And so this book is talking about the important question of the calendar. 
since ancient people use um, heavenly observations to understand you know, what time is it, what day is it, what month is it, and so on. So for all of us who we, you know, we get all of our, the calendars on the phone, everything's on the phone, the phone tells us anything we want to know. <laughs> but before that all existed, when we went outside, when um, in, we didn't live in a city with light pollution like I have, where we don't, can't observe almost anything, and we have all of this um, uh, artificial light, the way you would live would be much more in tune with the natural calendar, and um, there are several units of time that would have been obvious from observation. Of course, this begins with the day, and we still pay attention to days. <laughs> you know, a day consists of sunrise to sunset, and then all of the time period of darkness, nighttime until sunrise again. And so from this period, that period of time, that's a solar day. Doesn't, you can measure it either way. So we measure it from the beginning of the day to the end of the night, or actually from the middle midnight is where, where we do it modernly. Obviously, um, uh, Jewish people do it the opposite, right? So it comes at sundown is when the, when the day starts. But it's essentially the same length of time. Um, of course, the day, the length, between day and night changes. So at the equinox, day and night are equal durations, but in the summertime, uh, the day is gonna be longer and the night is gonna be shorter. And in the winter, like now, um, the day is shorter and the night is longer, but the solar day period is still the same length. So that's a unit of time that we can observe and measure the solar day. So if we take the time period uh, from equinox to equinox, you know, from the vernal equinox to the vernal equinox. If you observe the days getting longer and longer, and then shorter and shorter until they're back to being equal, then that time period that passes is a solar year. That's one year long. And we call that a, um, a tropical year, which is to say the time that takes between the equinoxes as opposed to a sidereal year, which is the time it takes, if you're watching the sky, for the sun to get to the same spot it is against, um, uh, against the constellations. So the sun is also moving in the sky against the constellations, which are fixed. At least it's observation, it seems to be moving. Obviously, we're actually moving. But observation-wise, the sun seems to be moving against the fixed constellations. The sidereal year, the star year, is actually 20 minutes longer than the tropical year. but the tropical year is what's important for the seasons. So that's the year that we'll talk about when we're talking about the solar year here. So that's a unit of time. We also have the observable month. And so the time period from when the month is, the moon is totally black as it's waxing crescent getting to the point of being a full moon and then a waning crescent and down to uh, black again. So that same time period, that's a lunar month. So, um, we don't observe these very much, but we still talk about days and months and years. These natural time units, if you're worrying about it, if you're an ancient person who's kind of worrying about making a calendar, however, uh, do come with one little problem. And that is the units do not actually match up. So we have a day, we have a month and a year, but the year isn't any particularly, you know, it's not an even unit of days. The year lasts 365 days, five hours, 48 minutes, and 50, 45 seconds. And so as a result of that, if you were just trying to have, you know, if you're, if you're just measuring days up and saying now that it's a new day, it's, the, it's New Year's Day, um, if you, the calendar would get off. So you would 365, but it gets off if you just uh, don't have any way to correct it. Likewise, the month is 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, <laughs> three seconds. So, um, so again, if you just are numbering the days and you're saying every 29th day you're having a new month, um, that will get off very quickly because uh, the month has got an extra half a day in there. And finally, same thing, if you're trying to line months up with years, there's 12.37 months in a year as opposed to just 12, and so these don't line up as you're trying to make a calendar. The easiest solution um, comes up short. 
So if we say, well, months are 30 days long, well, that's 11 hours too long. And so if you just made a month 30 days, it wouldn't take too long until your uh, months cease to line up with the actual phases of the moon. They would get off pretty quickly. Likewise, if you're going to make the year be 12 30-day months, in other words, you're going to make the year be 360 days, then that's five days too short. And so it wouldn't take very long for your calendar year to cease to line up with those equinoxes. And so the spring would constantly be moving and all the seasons would be moving. And at a certain point you're having, you know, uh, winter in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, you're having winter in July at a certain point because uh, the calendar is moving around. So, as you know, in the modern calendar, the Gregorian calendar, the Christian calendar, it is a solar calendar, which is slightly modified from the calendar uh, that the Romans had traditionally, but that was substantially uh, overhauled by Julius Caesar. So what's called the Julian calendar. The calendar aligns with the solar year. So as we said, the solar year is five hours or so longer than 365 days by consisting of 365 days most years, but as you know, uh, we add an additional day, a leap day, every four years. And then there's other little fixes to, to fix that over, the, like, over centuries and so on. And so that's how there is an intercalinary day in order to continue to make the calendar line up with the solar year. However, because the months are aligned to the solar year, they don't correspond with the moon's actual phases. If you want to know the moon's actual phases, you have to look it up on your phone. You have to have a calendar which will tell you, oh, there's a full moon tonight, or oh, there's a new moon tonight. You don't know that by based on the fact that it's you know, December 1st or February 1st because the months don't line up to the moon's phases in our Christian calendar. The Islamic calendar, by contrast, is aligned with the cycles of the moon. So uh, it has 12 months, which correspond to the beginning of the lunar cycle. And maybe you've seen when Ramadan is going to start the month of Ramadan, it has, they have to be observing the moon and the lunar cycle in order to decide when Ramadan is starting, uh, the officials, clerical officials. And so the result of this, though, is that uh, the Islamic year is only 354 or 355 days long. And so, as we know, that's far shorter than the length of a solar year, 365 and so on. And so as a result, um, in the Islamic year, the year seasons do continually shift. And that's why when Ramadan is, is constantly moving against our Gregorian calendar. Um, because it is not, they're not using, they're using a lunar year that is much shorter than a solar year. So um, the rabbinic calendar, the Hebrew calendar in Judaism is kind of a compromise between lunar and solar. It's called a lunisolar calendar. So the months in the Hebrew calendar al do align with the lunar cycle, just like the Islamic calendar. But as the seasons begin to drift out of alignment, um, an intercalinary month is added. So a whole leap month is added every second or third year, which causes the overall calendar to catch back up to the solar year. So it was already observed back in antiquity that every 19 years, you know, they don't line up the, the lunar and solar cycles, but every 19 years they do align. And so if you, um, uh, if you add um, an additional month at various points into your lunar calendar, you will be able to have enough months to every 19 years you have a cycle renew itself. But in the meantime, because these are added kind of ad hoc as they're needed every two or three years, um, not ad hoc, but they're on a cycle, uh, the, the calendar is slowly getting out of alignment on either way, and, but it's always... Uh, always lined up with the lunar cycle. And it's in generally, generally lined up with the solar cycle, but always a little off. 
Okay, so just as the Christian calendar we mentioned, that's not original to Christianity. That's not, Jesus didn't come down and say what, uh, now it's going to be the month of July, and now it's going to be the month of August. Uh, you can tell by the name July Julius Caesar and August Augustus Caesar, you can tell that this is coming from the Romans. In other words, it's adapted from the pagan calendar of Rome. In the very same way, the Hebrew calendar has its origins. Um, the earliest version is from the Sumerians, but it's uh, adapted and, and created from the Babylonians. And so um, it was adopted uh, by the Babylonians. We've talked about how much um, influence uh, uh, Persia and Babylon had uh, on Second Temple Judaism. It might have been already adopted before that, uh, before, even the, uh, before even the exile. Uh, but certainly by the, during the exile and afters, afterwards, uh, the Hebrew calendar adopted even the Babylonian names for most of the months, just like we have uh, the pagan Roman names for our months still. So even though, though, that became um, uh, the calendar for most of the sects of Judaism in the Second Temple period, and we can even see... Um, from a 5th century CE synagogue from Galilee. Um, this is a decoration in the synagogue that's of, this, that is of, a, uh, of a zodiac. And so in the middle of it is the god Helios with his chariot of the sun, and all around it are all the constellations. Well, the constellations of the zodiac uh, line up with the Babylonian calendar with the Hebrew calendar. Um, and this is presumably why that becomes a decoration in the synagogue. Nevertheless, not all Second Temple Jews agreed, and some of the sects, sects really um, rejected using the Babylon calendar, and that is especially true for the Essenes, so for the Qumran sect, uh, who are the people who created the Dead Sea Scrolls. So just as an aside, what about the week? <laughs> you know, so, so we have how the the days, how long the days are, how long the months are, and how long years are, and how they don't line up with anything. Um, so we also have this seven-day cycle of the week. So this is presumably, um, <clears throat> it was begun by the Sumerians, but promoted by Babylonian astrologers and astronomers, also promoted by the Persian Empire, based on the fact that there are seven planets and in antiquity, the planets are all of the moving uh, things in the heavens. So sun and moon are planets, along with uh, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. Those are the visible planets. Um, and so the, the days also follow that cycle and are named for um, uh, the same planets, although they're in a different order. So the planets... Uh, circling the earth as far as the ancients that were understood go the earth is in the different spheres moon sun mercury venus mars jupiter saturn uh, the days of the week are in the wrong order for that but it's uh, related and then in english um, the norse or germanic actually equivalents of um, of some of the gods so mars mercury uh, Jove and Venus are given over to their Germanic Anglo-Saxon variants, and that's why we have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. All right, so how does this week, this seven-day cycle that has been going on for thousands of years, what relationship does the week have to Gregorian calendars, months, and years? And so the answer is there's none. <laughs> it's free floating. So if we if we think about it, you know, this is why when we have holidays like the Fourth of July or the 25th of December or whenever it is, that those um, dates, the ones that are about a date, or New Year's Day, that those are continuously moving what day that's on. So it's because the days just follow one after another. So it's always. Uh, Sunday follows Saturday and Monday follows Sunday, that goes on and on forever no matter what month it is, no matter what, what year it is, and so on, right? So it is a free-floating cycle that is in fact not actually related to months and years. 
So, while the week had its origins among the ancient Sumerians, so in the third millennia even, BCE, it obviously took on some important religious significance in Judaism. So every seventh day in the Law of Moses is made a Sabbath, so work is supposed to cease. One of the Ten Commandments is, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So this idea was even worked into the priestly creation story in Genesis, where on each individual period of time, called a day, over the course of six days, creation uh, happens, and then on the seventh day, God rests. There's a Sabbath. Uh, and so the week is elevated to being cosmic and, and even divine within uh, Judaism and Mosaic law. So in addition to a weekly Sabbath, Sabbath, Mosaic law talks about a Sabbath year, so which is to say the seventh year when land is left fallow. So when you are growing crops, at a certain point, uh, crops will, de will deplete the soil and you have to leave. Nowadays, we rotate crops, but in this case, the idea is you would leave uh, it fallow and just not farm it for a year, let weeds grow and let the soil replenish uh, uh, so you can start again a Sabbath year. And also on that same Sabbath year, uh, debts, although not to foreigners, we let's not go crazy here, debts that you have to your neighbors are to be canceled and there are other, other things, for release of captives and so on on the, on the Sabbath year. We had a whole lecture on the Book of Jubilees, which is another one of these uh, apocalyptic books in this case. It's a retelling of the Bible by making a history that is really um, uh, zealously excited about the idea of jubilee years. So everything is occurring over the course of uh, 50, essentially 50 year period of time or 49 period of time. So at the end of a seventh year, you have a Sabbath. At the end of seven sevenths of years, 49. So a jubilee, um, it becomes an important, um, sevens become very important in this. So. Um, Jubilees is one of the books that the Qumran people like, uh, the Essenes, and like I say, different Jewish sects promoted different calendars. So here we go from the Book of Enoch, the astronomical book, uh, we get this authoritative so solar calendar. The Archangel Uriel shows Enoch that God has actually crafted the cosmos with a solar calendar in mind. So you're not supposed to be using this Babylonian lunisolar calendar that becomes the Hebrew calendar uh, that the Sadducees and the rabbis are using. No, this is a solar calendar that God is, uh, is providing. And so we read in 1 Enoch chapter 72, this is the first law of the luminaries. The luminary, the sun, has its rising in the eastern portals of the heaven and it's setting in the western portals of the heaven. And I saw six portals in which the sun rises and six portals into which the sun sets. And the moon rises and sets in these portals. And the leaders of the stars and those whom they lead, six in the east and six in the west, and all follow each other in accurately corresponding order as many windows to the right and left of the portals. So, so the whole system is set up with doors and gates and portals, and there's different ones that the sun goes into, and when the sun goes into it at different times, that is causing, um, uh, you know, that is, that's causing it at a different time. That is it corresponding to seasons, uh, and this, the Enoch and Uriel here, they go into great detail how this all works cosmically, and that's why we have to follow this calendar that results uh, from this. And so accordingly, the calendar presented in Enoch gives a year that is 364 days long. So you probably remembering that's a little bit too short for a true solar year, but it's close. It's a lot closer than a lunar year. Uh, the Enoch year is divided into four equal seasons. So the advantage of 364 as opposed to 365 and a quarter is that it's much more divisible. So these four equal seasons are able to be 91 days long each, and each of the seasons is three months long. 
And so there's two 30-day months followed by a 31-day month. That way you get up to 91 times four. Um, in addition, there are no intercalary leap days. And so this 364-day year is going to get off over time. Not too, it'll not, won't take too long for it to start getting off. We know we need a, with 365 days, we need a leap day every four years. So this is getting off every year. And there are also um, no leap months, meaning that the calendar floats, floats free technically of both the lunar and solar cycles over time, only it is doing it so slowly. So it is an inaccurate calendar, but um, the problem doesn't change so rapidly as, for example, the Islamic calendar does in terms of the solar year, where it gets off really crazy, really fast. It's a much slower decline. But the most important thing so, is that it stays connected to the week. So because um, you can take 364 and divide it by 52, 52 weeks, and you get seven, what that means is that uh, the, the, the weekdays, what day it is in the week, the weeks and everything like that co are constantly perfectly correct and always align. So we don't have this thing where, uh, you know, New Year's Day, January 1st, one day it's on a Tuesday, and then it's on a Wednesday, and then it's on a Thursday. No, it is always on the same, same day. And so um, I think even though, you know, sometimes this is considered sort of a primitive calendar because uh, it both fails to accurately uh, present both the solar year and the, the lunar uh, month, I think the reason it does that is because um, what the author of Enoch feels here is the week is the most important thing. Uh, because of the Sabbath. Okay, so that's the oldest sections and really um, the biggest amount of time. I know that this has already gone on for a little bit of time in terms of this lecture. There are three sections left, but I'm going to treat them much more um, briefly. So we have the parables of Enoch, the book of dream visions, and the epistle of Enoch. So the parables... Um, uh, are dated from as early as the first century, but as I say, they could be as late as the third century CE, first century BCE, um, and so it's because they're Christian images that might be interpolations or, or maybe not, it depends on how it's interpreted. Um, the text contains three lengthy parables or similitudes. All three of these are apocalypses, they all explain the cosmos through astronomy and the elements, just the same kind of thing as the rest of the text as we've already seen. They are all predicting the end of the world, final judgment, the punishment of the damned, including those fallen angels, the watchers, also predicting the resurrection, the glorification of the righteous, uh, the rise of a new world, a paradise, the final victory of the righteous. Um, all of these sort of uh, cosmic, apocalyptic um, prediction sort of uh, themes that are so central to um, some of the sects anyway in Second, Second Temple Judaism and certainly have an influence on early Christianity. Um, so again, like I say, this is especially popular with people who, uh, with devout people who are looking to uh, Jerusalem and the upper classes that are operating the temple and saying, we don't like the way you are doing things. We don't like uh, the collaboration with either the first the Persians and then the Greeks and finally the Roman officials. We want this to be changed so that we can um, have a truly uh, just world. And so they're hopeful that there will be a cosmic intervention at the end of time, which they assume will be soon. Okay, that's the book of parables. Oops, I'm sorry, there, that got put in. So the book of dream visions, those slides were in, interspersed there. Um, in the book of dream visions, Enoch recounts to his son, Methuselah, two visions. The first uh, vision that he has predicts the flood. So, of course, um, this is written many years, you know, obviously, and this is written maybe in the, in the second uh, century BCE. So, um, you know, the flood story is very old by this time, but Enoch here, pseudo Enoch, is able to predict the flood that's going to destroy 
um, the antediluvian world that uh, Enoch and Methuselah have grown up in. And so Methuselah's uh, uh, grandson, Noah, is the one that's going to uh, survive this. The second is an allegorical uh, retelling of biblical history down to the time period of the revolt of the Maccabees. Had a whole lecture on the Maccabees. The idea here is a, um, as the, the Hellenistic empires, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies uh, declined, they left a little window for um, a, a Jewish kingdom to emerge briefly as independent in the um, second century BCE, especially. So this uh, allegory is sometimes called the animal apocalypse because it retells you know, all of the Bible stories and then um, Second Temple period history down to the Maccabean revolt as an allegory where everybody is an, is an animal. And then, then after the Maccabean period, it continues on to, again, the apocalypse and the coming new world and all those kind of things, predicts an imminent end of the world, which didn't happen. And so that's why we can date this so much more closely to when it was actually written. In other words, it's written at the time period of history that the author writes his history to, and then all of his future predictions that didn't happen, you know, obviously after 143 BCE, where, which was when he was, right? So I just want to give you a little sample of the animal apocalypse so you can kind of understand it. Um, this is an allegorical retelling of part of the Bible. And as I read it, try to guess who these animals are. <laughs> so the Lord of the sheep sent the lamb to another lamb and raised it to being a ram and a leader of the sheep instead of that ram which had forsaken its glory. And it went, and it went to it and it spake to it alone and it raised it, it raised that lamb to being a ram and made the lamb a prince and leader of the sheep. But during all these things, those dogs oppressed the sheep. And the first ram pursued that second ram, and the second ram arose and fled before it. And I saw till those dogs pulled down that first ram. Whoa, what is all that? <laughs> Does any of that sound anything familiar at all? Um, I actually. I actually picked this out at random, and when I read it, I was able to piece together what, I, what was happening. So if we decode this thing, um, sheep in the animal apocalypse are the Israelites, and individual Israelites are lambs. And then when they have a leader, a king, that's a ram. And then we also have dogs. The dogs are the Philistines. And so what we have here is the Lord of the Israelites sent a lamb, Samuel, the prophet, to another lamb, David, and raised David to being a ram, a king. He made him a king of the sheep instead of that ram, which had forsaken its glory. So instead of King Saul, the other ram. And so then when we have that first ram, King Saul pursued the second ram, and the second ram in other words, Saul pursued David. David fled from Saul, and I saw that those dogs, the Philistines, eventually pulled down Saul, right? So this is a retelling, and this is what this whole thing is like. <laughs> so, so you have all these Bible stories which you kind of have to know, and then they're, they're just lambs and sheep and all that kind of thing. And so we have, like, for example, uh, just the kind of animals that you're getting out of it. So the sheep or the Israelites... The rams are the different leaders like David and Saul. It talks about herds of sheep. That'll be the individual Israelite tribes. We'll hear about wild asses. And so that's the Ishmaelites, the Bedouins, including the Midianites. Wild boars are the Edomites and the Amalekites. Bears are the Egyptians. Dogs are the Philistines. Hyenas are the Assyrians. Then when we get to the Hellenistic period, ravens represent the Seleucids, who live in Syria, the king of Syria. Kites represent the Ptolemaic Egyptians. Eagles, the Macedonians. And finally, foxes. The little foxes are Ammonites and Moabites. And so we get that whole thing retold all the way down to uh, the contemporary history of the Maccabean period and then 
after that, uh, the apocalypse continues, uh, you know, until the Lord of the sheep, you know, conquers the world for them and builds a, you know, after the apocalypse. Um, you know, so finally, um, the last uh, section is an additional composite text. So it's called the Epistle of Enoch, but there's actually a whole bunch of different sections. So one part is Enoch making exhortations or admonitions to Methuselah and his other children. There's another apocalypse, uh, where, an apocalypse of weeks, where uh, all of history is divided into uh, different periods, which again uh, predict uh, an apocalypse. Uh, very common theme that's repeated and repeated and repeated throughout this book. Uh, there, there's in the middle of this a, an epistle proper where Enoch is writing a letter to his children with more advice. We have a fragment from an unrelated book of Noah. And then finally at the end, the redactor who has put this book together and all the other components together sort of writes a final conclusion to the whole big book uh, of First Enoch. And that uh, is um, what we have for uh, giving a summary of Enoch. And that slide was out of order, so I'm going to go back and find this one to end on. And so I'm going to get a drink of water, and as Leandro is uh, collecting your questions, we can uh, field those. Um, I want to uh, begin by recognizing and thanking for your support, everybody who's made donations. So Mark Long, SkyBlue777, uh, Filippo Donoto, JMUS, Peg, uh, Peg, I'm sorry, Paige Shaughnessy, Daryl Scott, Michael Rogers, and an unrecognized talent who also says, this is the best Bible study channel on YouTube, in my opinion. So thank you so much uh, for your support and also for uh, your uh, words, your delight in the channel. We hope, I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, let's pull up here so I can read the next questions. So uh, Julie uh, Bazuski says, what other pre-flood patriarch who doesn't have a book of his own do you think would make a great hero of an apocalyptic story? Um, well, I guess, I guess I would say that since we really don't have uh, any, any names, um, you know, certain, who doesn't have a book of his own? So Seth ha definitely has a book of his own. Um, and so there's a whole Seth tradition. That's uh, the, the next son of Adam and Eve after as a replacement for Abel. Um, I think that um, I would be interested in following the, um, the lineage of Cain's family because I feel like those guys are busy inventing civilization, having cities, and uh, there was the guy who invented musical instruments, <laughs> and that sounded pretty interesting. So those are the only ones that we have any details of are, are from Cain's family. Everybody else, all we have is, is pretty much a name in terms of the pre-flood patriarchs. Um, in, the second, um, in the second list, the list that goes from Noah down to Abraham, we have a second guy that's sort of like Enoch, Peleg, and we have the additional detail from him. He's called Peleg, for in his day the world was divided. And so that is probably means that the Tower of Babel story is taking place when he was alive. But it, it also is just like that thing because God took him. It's just this little, little phrase that is um, you know, pregnant with possibilities. And so, um, so that's an interesting, uh, Peleg would be an interesting hero you know, post-flood, but anyway, in the same kind of early time period. Um, I also like... Uh, you know, in the post-flood times, but that same kind of contemporary to Abraham times, you know, Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. There he's, he has a place in some of these books, but um, you, know, you can have a whole apocalypse of Nimrod. That might be interesting. So there's a bunch of different ones that could inspire uh, writing still. 
Uh, Winston Barquez asks, uh, would you agree that intertestamental writings like Enoch are sources of New Testament beliefs in angels and demons, the resurrection of the body and the immortality of the soul? Yes, yes, I would definitely agree. So these are, um, these are just showing the context of all this. So uh, this is where, this is, uh, these are ideas that are developing and one of the ways they're being transmitted and remembered is, by, is through writing these texts. And this is certainly one of the more influential ones. And so yes, this is where um, these are the direct uh, influences on early Christian ideas. Uh, Winston also asks, uh, was uh, First Enoch derived from the Genesis Apocryphon document in the Dead Sea Scrolls? So I am not aware of that, so I don't know. And so it would also, the question I would have, it would be if, if so, I'd have to look at it, would it be which part of it? And so we saw that uh, First Enoch was derived from at least five discrete sources and actually more than that. And I'm not aware that the Genesis Apocryphon is any one of those. So I think it's probably the answer is no, but I would have to look it up. Elk of Antioch asks, um, where is the land of Nod thought to be? Uh, Isfahan or Asia or the Ganges? And so, um, so it's east of Eden, right? So Eden is usually thought to be at east at the edge of the world <laughs> and so and somewhere east of there i guess i don't know so i i, I think it's a you know again this is a um, a mythical land uh, um, anti from the antediluvian time period and so it's a anybody could decide uh where where they thought nod would be um you know somewhere somewhere to the east of where the uh, yahwist writer is writing which is you know, they have a fairly limited worldview, somewhere off in the, in the Far East is the idea. Alpha's Cav says, why are the early texts seemingly obsessed with listing every name? <laughs> is it just a writing style of the time? Why does the reader need to know all of these uh, lists of dozens of names? Um, I think, so I don't think you're probably referring to the uh, uh, to Genesis and the, maybe you are, but Genesis and the begat list. So the idea of that is to, to show, it's like a king list, it's to show a, uh, a continuity with the beginning of time um, and to try to give a kind of a, an idea that as these cycles are happening, there is, you know, like a continuity and we're heirs to this original person. So that would be a genealogy list. In terms of the, um, the Book of Enoch, where they're listing off all of these uh, the 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 leaders of all of the the demons, um, you know, at a certain point, you know, there was a talking about how the demons taught people how to do enchantments and how to uh, the fallen angels, the watchers taught everybody how to do enchantments and counter enchantments and things like that. Um, at a certain point, you're using these names when you're doing magic, even you're not supposed to do magic, <laughs> you know, and so and so these names become important. Um, so that you are able to, uh, you know, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of that kind of belief system, a magical and enchanted worldview. Let's uh, pull up again the, we're to Paige uh, Shaughnessy. And she asks, at what point in antiquity did uh, the end of the world ideas begin what, ancient, what religion or ancient peoples were the first to envision this? So this is happening um, um, very early in, in Zoroastrianism. And so Zoroastrianism is among the first, what we think of as a world religion, a religion that is different from um, you know, the earlier uh, you know, uh, view of this kind of chaotic world that has multiple gods in a pantheon. Um, you know, where we are just doing maintenance by, uh, by doing all the rituals necessary to maintain life and appease the gods and to offer sacrifices and all that kind of thing. Paganism um, that uh, we now call paganism, but that is uh, kind of consistent uh, after animism, a stage of, of religion. So the next, this next kind of evolution, when you start to have world empires uh, and great states, it, um, and the Persian Empire being one of the, the first really great multi-ethnic empires. Um, 
uh, is also sees the development of, uh, of a Persian world religion that is a dualist religion. And so uh, there's one great God and then there's uh, who's good and there's one uh, rival, a cosmic evil God, the devil. Uh, and that they are uh, in combat and this explains the problem of evil, why, why there's suffering, why there's all this torment in the world. Uh, the good God is trying to uh, stop that from happening, but he's being thwarted by uh, the evil God and all of the evil God's little demons who are running around doing horrible things. But, you know, we can, we can all f feel excited about that or be happy about it in Zoroastrianism because at the end of time, there'll, well, like there'll be a Messiah, there'll be a savior who will come uh, defeat the forces of evil, God will ultimately triumph over the devil, the old world will be destroyed, and a new world that is a paradise will uh, be born in its place. And so I would say, um, whenever this is, is in the 1000 BCE or 900 BCE, 800 BCE, this kind of time period is when Zoroastrianism is developing, I don't have the dates in front of me, um, and, and it's probably the first. And so then, um, um, I believe anyway that then that religion influences uh, uh, the developing Second Temple religion, uh, especially when the exiles are in captivity in, in Babylon and they are Babylonianizing, they are um, starting to speak, uh, they're losing their Hebrew, they're going to start speaking Aramaic, and there's all of these influences that happen in that Persian period when the beginning of the First Temple period, uh, Jerusalem is is simply a, a provincial capital of a, Persian, of, of a province of the Persian Empire. Uh, Jason Kukulo asks um, if Anunnaki actually means um, men of renown, not uh, sky people, could the sons, um, so the angel sons of El and the Nephilim giants originally been informed by high ranking uh, ancient kings that were mythologized? Um, so we don't have any, so we wouldn't have it. So the, um, so Genesis only has that, that very brief explanation, right? So we don't have, uh, any, uh, we don't have any of the lists of those names. So if we had a bunch of different names of, uh, in Genesis, uh, of, um, who these, men of renown are, or who the Nephilim's names are, then we could have said, well, those, maybe those are, are ancient kings that are being mythologized. Um, so, so yeah, maybe as a general concept, that's maybe where those ideas of giants and, and heroes and kings are coming from, but we just don't have that. We just have the briefest outline of that in Genesis. And so then when they're, um, when they're created and elaborated centuries later in a book like the Book of the Watchers, the Book of Enoch, these are, um, we're taking that source text and expanding it. So it is not an ancient king that's being mythologized. It's the source text um, that is already authoritative. It's the Torah that is the source as opposed to um, a king. So that's what I would say. Um, Alf, Alpha's Cav is asking, uh, what are they referring to when they're talking about a large house made of crystal. Didn't they, have, they didn't have glass blowing or hardware or leadware yet, did they? No, so they're not, um, I don't think that they're talking about, um, so I mean, the, there, is, there is glass manufacturing, but I don't know that it's happening as much in the Levant. There, it's definitely a thing that, I th and definitely the Romans are known for that later, but maybe not at this time period, are they having a lot of that? What I, I, I'm just envisioning here is, they're thinking of things that are are gorgeous, so precious gems, crystals, and rocks. So, you know, those are all uh, and fire and things. You know, and, and, and so they're just trying to envision this. And so, I think it's sort of like uh, from the um, the Superman movie from the 1970s. You know, where you go to the Fortress of Solitude and it has all those crystals and ice and glowing and everything like that. I mean, there's it's just something to be very otherworldly. They're trying to make a house that is God's house, and so it has to be you know, otherworldly, and they don't have words to um, describe it even at this point. Filippo Dinotto asks, how far back can we track the current seven-day cycle concurrently backwards in time? 
are we sure it's really Tuesday today? So, so I know, I know, I tried to look this up to try to find out how early we know it's going. Um, and I, th and I feel like, uh, I feel like we don't know much past, um, I don't know, 25 or 2600 years, you know, so, so I think it could be going on a lot, lot longer, but I don't know that we have, um, I don't know that we have the list of the exact days and that maybe a, a day didn't skip in there somewhere <laughs> or other, um, but I think it could be old, a lot older than that. But it's been going on a long time and, and it's been called, for example, um, the longest continuously operating uh, human institution, the, the week, <laughs> because we've been following the seven day cycle and it's been the same seven days for at least over 2000 years, whereas most other things there's no continuity like that. You know, the, um, the, the rest of the calendar, the, the Gregorian calendar had a big reset um, in, in North America here. It happened in the 18th century. So a whole bunch of days were, were lost in one of the years uh, in, order to bring the, in order to bring the calendar back into alignment the way it was supposed to be when the, the shift was done from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar. So that doesn't have anything like that kind of continuity. Whereas the days of the week, we've been going in that same cycle for at least 2,000 years, a lot more probably. And so it may well be the, the longest ongoing human institution uh, uh, that's artificial. Um, Michael Rogers says, um, would you consider books like Enoch and the Infant Gospel fan fiction expansion on popular stories. So, so there's this idea um, uh, in, in Hebrew writing of, of midrash, which means, which could mean like fan fiction, but it's the idea of how can we do, um, how can we do, when we don't have the details of something, we have these questions, how can we do thoughtful, um, positive, you know, like uh, writing uh, where we are expanding and giving answers where answers don't exist, but not contradicting the original texts. And so, um, so a lot of these are that kind of expansion. And, um, and you know, that could, be, that could be a kind of fan fiction, but it's a fan fiction that is done um, very deliberately where you're trying not to contradict anything and also where you're doing it with uh, generally generally pious intent and so so i would consider it that way yes and 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 that continues to this day so there are um you know the book of daniel is an example of that so it's, it's books that are it, that made it into the canon as well um alphas cab asks are there any guesses as to what period of time the Book of the Watchers is supposed to have occurred in. Are we talking pre-Bronze Age collapse? Yes, it's supposed to be taking place in uh, the pre-flood. <laughs> so it's a mythical time period. It's the lost um, golden age. It's a different era of the, of the world, so it's a mythic time. Um, but yeah, way pre-Bronze Age collapse, so it's before, before actual real history. It's a mythic time, and long, uh, once upon a time, we might say. Uh, the Elk of Antioch says, dumb question, how did Jesus end up speaking Aramaic instead of Hebrew in Israel? It's, uh, yeah, it's not dumb. It's, so it's the, when the exiles um, returned, um, they began, I mean, whether or not they, whenever, whenever it exactly happened, um, Hebrew began being displaced in the second temple period, and it became the common tongue of all of their neighbors. So their neighbors all, you know, all began speaking Aramaic, which is a very related language, but everybody um, in the Levant at a certain point is all speaking Aramaic, which is one of the uh, lingua franca of the Persian Empire. So the Persians use a couple different languages for rule and administration and commerce, and you're just going to get along a lot better and be able to Know, go to court and pay your taxes and, and read the royal instructions and everything else if you are speaking Aramaic. And so Aramaic is also, at a certain point, it will have been, will have been an elite language and so slowly trickles down and replaces uh, down to what the, what the common people, the peasants, are speaking. And that's how Jesus uh, just ends up growing up speaking Aramaic. By that time, for centuries um, as well, there will have been a new elite language, Greek, uh, for centuries will have conquered and 
uh, will be the language of the ruling elite. And then most recently, in Jesus' time, um, there's a new elite language, Latin, that is for the military. Uh, although uh, the administration will still be done in Greek. And so a lot of times when that happens, um, when there's a new elite language, a lot of times that's what actually kills off the, um, the previous early language. <laughs> so, so it's like, for example, uh, in, the, in the Roman Empire in Gaul, people were still maintaining some of the Celtic languages, some of the Gaulish languages, but when the Germans conquered Gaul, then the local people just couldn't have both. They just kept Latin and then uh, the Germanic was over top of it as a conqueror's language for a while until it eventually, uh, until they Latinized the German conquerors in the case of France, uh, and it became French. So that's um, uh, Alan Young, I'm on. I'm okay. <laughs> it's okay, Leandro's distracted because you guys keep asking questions, <laughs> which is good. Um, so Alan Young asks, did the LDS prophet Joseph Smith have access to the Dead Sea Scrolls? No. So um, he, this is not where he got any, any, of, any of these things from. So some of these, um, some of these ideas uh, continued uh, on. So, um, so for example, even though uh, the Book of Enoch does not, did not survive in um, the West, some of these same ideas worked their way into um, Jewish Midrash writing. And so there is a medieval Jewish text called the Book of Jasher, or the Book of Jashar, that uh, got translated into English, and Joseph Smith did get a hold of that in the um, 1840s. Um, that didn't necessarily inform his Enoch stories, but it did uh, inform some of his ideas later, probably because he then had access to a book that had some of these same ideas written in the Middle Ages uh, by a Jewish scholar. So he did have access to some of these things, and there was, of course, the Apocrypha and other, uh, other things, but not to uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Captain Hardluck uh, said, is the story of David being encoded with furry analogies in Enoch to perpetuate the story without some risk of persecution. The encoding seems shallow otherwise. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I don't think that that's happening for that reason. Maybe, maybe there is a, maybe, maybe there is a anti Temple and Maccabean elite issue that's happening right when it gets down to the present day. Um, but the, the coding is so obvious <laughs> that I don't think that, you know, once you, I think, you, I think that the, the temple priests in Jerusalem would be able to see that they were, you know, like a hyena that was in charge of God's holy place or whatever, and, some, and, then the, and soon the, the righteous ram is going to come and unseat them and, and drive all the hyenas or jackals away or something like that. I think that they would, I think they would get the meaning. So I don't know that it is actually um, doing that. I think it's just... Uh, Somebody got the idea of doing a very, um, you know, a symbolic story. So sometimes we talk about Jesus as the Lamb of God, and we have a lot of these, um, this kind of imagery. And somebody got that in their head and decided to do an entire book <laughs> like that, an entire animal apocalypse where they retell the Bible that way. So, um, Daryl Scott asks, is there anything in the context of the Book of Enoch which caused it to be especially valued by the Ethiopian church and therefore preserved there. Um, I know that, so it's hard to say that that would be the case. I know that it, because they had it, it has affected like, uh, the development of the Ethiopian church. And so it, is, it continues to have an influence in how uh, Ethiopian orthodoxy understands things and understands Christianity. I think that what happened was, is that this was a book that early Christians liked a lot and that many early Christians assumed was biblical, um, but including some of the very earliest church fathers. But then what ended up happening was in the later, um, in the later, uh, you know, like when it becomes a, the Roman imperial church, the last of these kind of, um, thinkers, including like Latin leaders like Augustine and Jerome, who were in charge of kind of 
uh, deciding what the canon is going to be for Christians in the Roman Empire, they, they put the kibosh on it, and so, then it they, and so then it's lost in the Roman Empire, and the Ethiopians, who are already off in their own thing, um, don't get the memo and just keep, keep having it. And I think that's why it's preserved there. It essentially is because of the, um, the fact that the Ethiopian church is its own separate uh, organization from the Roman state church that emerges, and then later it's, um, and later it's cut off entirely. So, and so they have their own, they don't have the same canonization process that the rest of the Greeks and the, the Latins had together. La Sombra says, do you think the fallen sons built uh, pyramid structures from Egypt to uh, Mexico and India? No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's an interesting question, but yeah. So, but, um, so these, are, these are legendary figures, and I know that people um, love to, they look at the pyramids and they see that these are such amazing things and they wonder how ancient people would be able to construct them. Um, and... Uh, and the fact that there are the same kind of structure where you are piling rocks on each other and making a big art artificial mountain is one of the easier structures to create engineering-wise compared to, you know, making a super tall skinny obelisk or something that uh, that is is more difficult. And so it isn't. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not a, too, a crazy coincidence that different ancient peoples came up with that same form because of the way they, they um, did it was very different. So the Egyptian use of that structure is very different um, where you have a, a large ornamental mound that is over, built over top of a tomb where the tomb is encased within it and underneath it, whereas in um, the Mexican pyramids, uh, uh, Central Mesoamerican pyramids, you have um, uh, a temple that's built on top of an artificial hill. So it's the same form, but it has a totally different uh, idea and use behind it. And so, um, you know, those forms are what you would naturally, coincidentally come up with. And ancient people were able to make them themselves without uh, fallen angels helping. Tony777 asks, uh, a great mystic of our era said that Jesus was a Greco-Israelite. Any comments on this? So, so the, um, there's been direct um, Greek influence in uh, Galilee, which is where Jesus is from, for, uh, you know, uh, very directly in terms of rulership for over three centuries. Um, and, um, and there were Greek-speaking cities um, just down the street, you know, that were established. And so, so there is definitely, and, and actually there was Greek connections with the Israelites for centuries before the actual uh, Macedonian, the Greek conquest of uh, Judea and uh, Samaria and Galilee. And so, and so people um, have made the comment that, yeah, um, Jesus is coming from uh, an divesh, especially um, diverse society uh, where he might have known a little bit of Greek because he, because in, for business, you might have had to know how to do, uh, how to know some Greek words in order to um, uh, do carpentry in the neighboring town, which is where all the money was. And so that might well have been part of it. So there might, there, there may well have been lots of um, Greek influences on Jesus. Uh, but what I try to do is, um, stay very close to the sources and see where we, where we find some of those. And uh, when we try to do that, when we do our lectures on the historical Jesus. Um, so Jeannie uh, says, finally, um, I think someone was hoping I would enter, John would introduce himself, I would introduce himself. It might be nice for our newcomers to know uh, who I am. <laughs> also, some are asking what my religion is. So, so yeah, we don't usually do that. Although I do think that that does that is something that happens um, in the comments. They say, "Who is this guy?" <laughs> so, yeah, my name is John Hamer. I serve as the pastor of the Community of Christ Toronto congregation here downtown Toronto, Toronto Center Place. So this. Um, uh, congregation was first organized in 1836, so a very long time ago, and I serve as the 40th pastor 
uh, if you, we can do one of those lines and history and charts of all of the predecessors uh, to, my, to me. Uh, Community of Christ is part of the restoration tradition uh, and or related to uh, Latter-day Saintism and Mormons. And so that's why we sometimes talk about uh, Joseph Smith. We represent a, a very progressive uh, uh, branch of that movement. So we're, for example, an LGBTQIA affirming, um, and we have uh, women in all levels of leadership. So at our church's headquarters, half of our council of 12 apostles are women. And, and in fact, actually last week, um, it was just announced that the new uh, prophet and president of our church for the first time will be a woman, President Stacy Cram. Um, and so those are the background of the denomination. In terms of my background, um, my ancestors first joined uh, this church, this movement, seven generations ago. So uh, my great-great-great-great-grandparents, just like the same four greats that separate Adam down to Enoch. Um, and uh, let's see, I um, did most of my uh, schooling, graduate work in medieval European history, which I was working on becoming a medieval history professor. But then I got attracted away into uh, working for university presses uh, as a map maker, as a uh, book publisher. And so I went on a kind of different path that ended up leading me um, back to uh, focus on this now uh, as my um, calling later in life. And so that's a little bit of an introduction. So we'll be able to ask any one of those kind of questions that you want um, next week, where we're going to do a question and answer from the beginning. There's not going to be a formal lecture. So please continue to send your questions in. We'll address them next week. Don't forget to like, to share this video, subscribe to our channel. And always, we very much appreciate if you donate. And so please consider doing that. It's centerplace.ca slash donate. And next week, we will, like I say, do that uh, Q&A answer.